Welcome to today's ELGL webinar about how smart cities are rethinking community engagement with a unified engagement approach. Um, we're really excited today to have Graham Stone from Public Input, as well as Emily Haggerty from the city of Greenville, South Carolina, and Nicole Venezia from H2M Architects and Engineering with us today. I am ELGL Membership and Programs Director, Emily Elders. And I am um, really excited to moderate today's conversation. ELGL is the Engaging Local Government Leaders Network. We engage the brightest minds in local government. That's you guys. And publicinput.com is one of our best and most favorite partners. They are a community engagement and communication software that's utilized in communities as small as 600 residents to as large as over 1 million. To kick us off today, we'll have Graham Stone from Public Input, who will get us started on unified engagement and how it's emerging as a best practice. Graham? Yeah, thank you, Emily. I, uh, I, I really appreciate it. You know, I also want to extend a, uh, a really sincere thanks uh, to both Nicole and, uh, and, and the other Emily um, for taking the time you know, to look back on, on some of their past projects uh, and, and to help us see how those have come together. Uh, and study them. So uh, you know, I'm always proud to point out that um, the publicinput.com platform is almost like a crowdsourced solution, evolving constantly based on the feedback and the conversations uh, that we're fortunate to have with the local governments and consulting partners uh, that are speaking up with and making decisions on behalf of uh, our communities every day. So, um, so really, it's been through this careful listening to professionals like Nicole and Emily um, who are adapting mixed mode engagement um, as a best practice, that we realized unifying the process uh, is really where we uh, as, as a software can truly provide um, value and, and take their efforts to the next level. Um, so I think if we hop over to the, to the mixed mode engagement slide, if you're not already there, um, Emily, um, <clears throat> I would point out that um, even far back in, in, in 2005, so uh, 15 years ago, uh, researchers were recognizing that conducting outreach and surveying using uh, limited communications channels um, almost guaranteed biased results, um, right? So the, at the time, um, we can all remember that far back, the, the canary in the coal mine was the, the decline of uh, response rates in, in telephone surveys, right? But that, um, but that was kind of hinting at that much broader problem. Uh, so over the past 15 years, um, the methods of reaching people have increased significantly, right? Uh, online, uh, social, digital communications channels really proliferating. And, uh, and this mixed mode approach um, has become widely recognized as a best practice for reaching um, a broad audience, getting a more representative sample of participants, um, even reducing uh, survey sample error, uh, which ironically was the concern around leaving those statistically valid uh, phone surveys in the first place. Uh, in, in looking at why uh, mixed mode engagement uh, can be difficult, um, a lot of the people on the on the line today um, are probably uh, very aware in a firsthand uh, fashion that multiple tactics often lead to siloed off data, right, and, and communication, uh, which then leads to those all too familiar engagement hurdles like um, a lack of certainty that you're reaching uh, and engaging a broader community, a representative audience, uh, telling a, a story that may not be as clear as uh, we'd like it to be. So having a variety of different formats um, could mean we're just creating noise rather than a truly sort of clear signal. Uh, tools that, that end up, you know, hurting our efforts uh, rather than helping, but, you know, maybe creating a norm for siloed input uh, and then losing some of that feedback in the process because we have um, such a wide variety of places that we've we've asked people to participate um, that it's nearly impossible uh, and uh, the work that is created um, in trying to consolidate all of that data ensure that we go back and retrieve it um, and then of course right uh, aggregate it and and uh, and make sense of it so that you know that in mind uh, moving on to uh, to the next slide um, we want to keep in mind, right, the goal uh, of all of our engagement efforts, which, which is equity, right, equity in the process, making sure that um, everybody gets a voice. And, um, and oftentimes, right, when we have those numerous different engagement channels, those wide variety of ways that we're gathering information, um, it, it presents the opportunity 
for uh, some of those formats to have um, more influence or, or a louder voice um, than others. So, for example, if you're if you're looking at this graphic here, um, you know, social media, right, is is often uh, is an often utilized tool uh, to distribute messages, right? And uh, and Facebook, for example, it's it's targeted advertising capabilities are um, well known. Uh, the ability to push messages in front of uh, geographic and even demographic audiences um, really help ensure that we're reaching, uh, you know, low use proficiency or environmental justice communities, um, specifically impacted people. Um, the thing that we've realized, though, uh, over the years is that um, when communities use this and, and they're doing a great job of that, um, it's not unusual for those posts themselves uh, to become a discussion forum uh, rather than uh, the people who see those clicking on the link and maybe then going to the online survey, uh, that post becomes a forum for discussion and people leave their comments there. Uh, and unless we have a way to grab that and bring it into the, uh, into the conversation in a formal sense, uh, then those voices have been left out of, uh, of the comment database, right, that is being uh, analyzed and considered. Uh, you know, think of also, you know, emails to staff. Uh, we're obviously required um, to offer, um, you know, an, an email point of contact for public comment. And those do get a stronger position as they oftentimes, right, with environmental, uh, like NEPA um, compliance mandates, they require a response. Um, however, if you think about it going straight to the source and still speaking at a public meeting, um, that that can carry more weight uh, because not only are those comments delivered directly to decision makers who you know go home after the meeting and think about them as they're eating dinner, um, they're also transcribed in the public record for that uh, analysis. So they may still carry more weight uh, even though we are using those mixed modes uh, to gather more input. Um, we haven't necessarily given each of those uh, an equal footing to stand on. Um, so the reality is that, that equity in the process um, means um, we afford all residents the ability for that voice uh, to be equal to their neighbors, um, regardless of whether or not they can attend a meeting, um, visit a website, send an email, uh, comment on, on social media, uh, or, or utilize any other communication channel that, that may arise, because this is, uh, as everybody's aware, a, a really constantly evolving space. And we're, we're learning every day new ways to communicate with people. and um, and we have to be able to uh, accommodate those because it is about reaching people where they are and being able to participate um, on the go. You know, the mission here for us at, at Public Input, um, it's really become bringing all engagement together into one process, ensuring that no data, no communication falls through the cracks, letting you see a, a clear and, and complete picture so by by unifying right the engagement process, um, local governments can create not only um, more meaningful relationships with their residents right by hearing them and and responding to them easily and efficiently, uh, having those conversations that do uh, build that trust over time, um, but also giving them the ability to to analyze that information, to bring it all into one place, uh, and to make more data driven decisions. Um, in order to, to ensure that we are incorporating all of those, all of those voices into, uh, into the process. Uh, and so at the end of the day, um, you know, unifying this engagement process, uh, being able to take that, uh, that mixed mode uh, approach, which is a best practice, which we do not want to abandon. We want to make sure um, that it, no matter how someone can participate, um, we are able to bring that into the process and give everybody that equal footing um, for the decisions we're going to make, uh, no matter how it is that they engage. And, uh, and so I'm really excited to, to hand it off to um, Nicole and to Emily uh, at H2M and, and at Greenville, South Carolina, uh, to, to sort of take what I just said in a more academic sense and, and apply a story to it. Uh, so again, I, I really want to extend a thanks to, to both of them for taking the time out of their day uh, to share their personal stories with us. And, and again, let us learn uh, from the experiences that they've got um, and with their feet on the ground and, and the face of the uh, of their communities.
Thank you, Graham. Um, that was a really excellent overview. Um, let's see how this is working for a couple of different communities. Um, so our first panelist is Emily from the city of Greenville. Emily, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do in Greenville? Hey, yeah. Um, my name is Emily Hegarty, and I serve as the Economic Development Marketing Analyst in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, and we have sort of used public input. We, we haven't had it for all, all that long, probably about just over a year, maybe two years. And um, it has been, uh, we've kind of hit the ground and, and went running with it. Um, so we, uh, as a city, have, have used it in many different departments from transportation study to our downtown master plan to um, some of our specific things like our rail trail planning process. Um, and then some corridor plans as well. But um, the one I'm gonna to talk to you about today specifically um, is our downtown master plan. And uh, so this was a plan that we did last year and we wanted to really engage the community um, and, and not necessarily, you know, using public input, you're able to reach folks um, and doing an online survey, you're able to reach folks that wouldn't necessarily be able to make a public meeting. And sometimes that is, your working mothers or um, folks who don't have transportation, et cetera, that, that maybe can go online and can access the survey, um, or maybe they just don't have time to go to the public meeting or uh, that sort of thing. And so we used it um, and kind of incorporated it along with our public meetings so that we could kind of cover all of our bases. Um, so this downtown master plan, we have a really great downtown and um, but we're expanding and we have a huge influx of people who are constantly moving to Greenville because it the word has gotten out that we are a really cool very young professional driven kind of area and um, so so uh, we wanted to take a look at our downtown and say all right well where do we go in the next 10 years um, and so we set up a bunch of meetings we hired a consultant and uh, we kind of worked using public input to um, to kind of go through those meetings. So uh, we did a, a survey online and then we also used their, their kiosk kind of sign-in function and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and that was really helpful too in capturing email addresses and people who were engaged. And so that was a really good way to kind of cluster everybody into one home base. Um, okay, so moving along to the next slide. Um, we uh, got the word out. We usually kind of hit it from the, uh, various different approach, approaches, excuse me, um, where we're kind of doing emails, we are doing Facebook groups and social presence, and then we're also using the public input kind of online survey aspect, and then they also have like an event type uh, aspect on, on the website as well. So people can kind of RSVP there. We don't really take the RSVPs seriously, but we want it, uh, we kind of utilize that algorithm when one person says that they're coming on Facebook, it tends to share it. And so, oh, well, your friend said that they're interested in this or five of your friends are interested in this. It might be something you're interested in. So that's a really great way to get it out. Uh, we kind of just hit it from different approaches. So on the left of your screen, you'll see we have this great newsletter that goes out every weekday in Greenville called Gville Today. And a few other cities have it now as well, but it started in, in Greenville. Uh, and it's kind of this young professional email newsletter, and it's it's really great. It gives you sort of the recap of what's going on this week. And so they were great. They they covered it for us, and so they just got our press release the same way every other media outlet did, and um, they covered the story. And then that links folks over to the survey and to the Facebook page and that sort of thing. But um, but definitely the survey. So. So that's really great because people don't necessarily have to come out to a meeting to feel engaged and participate. Um, they're still able to get their voice heard. Um, so we, we generally hit it with Facebook and Instagram. Uh, then it goes out to the press. We'll usually have a couple media folks come out to um, whether it's a presentation or when we're doing the charrette process where we're having these kind of drop in and meet the, um, the consultants who are the designers and you kind of get to look over their shoulder and work with them at the same time. Uh, we usually have some media folks come out like television stations that will cover some of that. And then um, going into the in-person outreach, when we are doing our meetings, we use um, iPads. We kind of just have with our within city, um, our IT department will lend out either you know, iPads or 
uh, laptops and that sort of thing. And so I just go and I'll request four for a meeting and um, public input has this kind of online kiosk thing and you set it up however you want it. But basically it's just, uh, I generally do sort of your name, your email address, and then oftentimes I'll do a zip code or something that's not required, but kind of gives you a better idea if they're a local person or, or you know, what they're specifically, uh, where they're living or how it relates to, to them. Uh, so then we have folks sign in on iPads, which is really great because A, it's eco-friendly. People seem to really appreciate that. Um, and then B, there's no manual entry when you get back to the office, which is really nice because <laughs> sometimes that can take um, a lot of extra time. And, uh, and so um, if they need help with it, we are there. We usually have two folks kind of hanging out at the sign-in table to make sure that they can get it all typed in because of course not everybody is um, great at using an iPad, but you'd be surprised how many actually are, uh, especially some of the older folks. They, they can navigate it better than me sometimes. Um, <laughs> then the other aspect of this is that people generally have terrible handwriting. That is sort of the big takeaway that I've found um, when we were doing the paper kind of um, handwritten things, I would spend a lot of time deciphering, okay, is that an R or an A or what is that? And so this has kind of alleviated all of that, which is kind of nice. Um, and the last thing you want to do is to miss somebody just because you m couldn't read their handwriting. Um, yeah, so moving along. Um, so once you capture all of these email addresses, it's all in this system and it's all tied to the specific plan that you're working on, which is really nice. And so with the downtown master plan, we were able, and frankly, all the plans, once you have everybody's name in the system or their phone numbers, et cetera, uh, it, it's often linked to their survey results because all of this kind of information starts to come together when they're typing in their email address. And then you're able to also then communicate everything out once you have, for example, the, the presentation that we did at the event. Immediately following the event, we were able to email that out quickly and easily through public input just because they um, we had already captured their emails and it was already good to go right then and there. And so folks really like when you engage with them and kind of give them the opportunity. And so folks who did not attend the meeting but are also already in that system are being captured as well. And then even though they weren't at the meeting, they're able to see some of the presentation materials. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about how with some of the demographics in the survey, you're able to drill down and kind of get a good consensus of folks who, uh, and how it might, how that project may relate to them. For example, we are doing a rail trail uh, project right now where we're expanding our Swamp Rabbit Trail. And so we wanted to compare, okay, well, how does the neighborhood feel about this versus the folks who are going to be driving in to use the trail? Because they're kind of two different opinions and you kind of want to get the, a good idea of how each of the, the groups feels. And so using public input, you're able to kind of uh, separate the data out and just kind of look at answers based on a certain question. So sometimes we ask, do you live in the survey area? Do you, you know, how do you utilize this area? Do you drive in? Do you do this? Do you do that? And that way you're able to kind of look closer at the data to see, okay, well, I know that a lot of people are complaining about uh, they just want this to be a super highway. Um, I'm thinking about one of our corridor plans, and specifically, we were looking at maybe slowing down or road dieting. And we were like, okay, well, um, a lot of folks just want to drive through, but a lot of the people who just wanted to, to keep the road a highway were the folks who didn't live anywhere nearby. And so you kind of have to weigh, well, what do the residents want versus um, other people, and you, you have to accommodate everybody's needs, but it is nice to be able to drill down and see the differences and what people are looking for. So here you can just see some of the sort of the heat map of where folks were responding from, um, and that it makes it really helpful when you are looking at those answers. And then just looking at uh, people people's responses. You know, is it what what are you specifically looking for um, when you're answering these surveys? And so we do some where we only offer a couple answers and that way we're really able to look at like, kind of narrow it down a little bit more. And then we do some open-ended because that I think is, is helpful in people being able to express themselves and what they're specifically looking for. This kind of shows some of the um, upcoming meetings and utilizing the meeting function where people can RSVP. 
and then also shows one of the emails that we have gotten out, uh, sent out and um, and basically, okay, well, stuff has been updated. Here's, this is where you go and just staying in contact with folks. And you can see that we have 899 participants with our Swamp Rabbit Trail Extension Master Plan, uh, which is like the longest name ever. But uh, <laughs> so we had um, 14,000 responses. That is really great. I mean, and of course that incorporates different questions, but um, folks are really energized about that and, and wanted to give a lot of feedback. But uh, we are careful when we do capture people's email addresses because we, we do not specifically want to just start sending all emails to those people. Uh, we generally, once we capture that for a specific meeting or event type thing, so let's say for the downtown master plan, we are not going to start sending them stuff for the Swamp Rabbit Trail. We may send them one opt-in email saying, hey, you might be interested in this, but we are not going to be just capturing their email without their permission. If you think if you're upfront about that, it's fine, but um, just be careful about that. I think overall your mission is to build community trust. And uh, I think in, through these planning processes, people love being asked what their opinion is. And ultimately working in a municipality, you get a lot of folks who complain or have issues with things, et cetera. And so it's really nice when we've done these surveys, we've gotten a lot of really good feedback. And that, that can really motivate a team, which is nice. But it, people just want to be engaged. They want to be heard. And um, I think this has really given us a good platform to be able to do that. And it's been evident in some of the answers. And so I think that kind of trickles down into your pride of your city or your town or whatever it may be, your county. And so it's been really beneficial for us in that not only are we able to craft, you know, okay, we, we want to know what our citizens want and we're able to craft that uh, based on these surveys, but at the same time, people feel engaged and feel heard. And so that is really, really effective uh, for us. And I think that helps your council members, et cetera. One thing I did not touch on earlier that I just want to add before we, before my little portion is over is some of the visuals uh, basically, when you're in public input, you can uh, look at the, at the answers of the questions, and it provides a lot of visuals to effectively communicate. I think we utilize them. It, when you answer the questions in the options, and there are no photos of it in this slide, but basically, you are able to export those visuals into PowerPoints or whatever, and that way you can communicate to your team uh, internally the work that you're doing. And I think it, it speaks so much louder when you see an actual visual versus it being typed out or just kind of numbers and that sort of thing. Your people respond really well to, to images. And that sort of concludes my little section. And um, get us started. So um, thank you, Nicole, for joining us. Can you uh, get us started with a little bit about yourself and the work that you do with H2M? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicole Venezia. I'm a project planner working with H2M architects and engineers. Uh, I'm a licensed urban planner in the state of New Jersey. And just to give you a little bit of background about what my company does, uh, H2M is a multidisciplinary architecture and engineering consulting firm located and working in the New York metropolitan region. So as a consultant planner, I'm most often hired by local municipalities, either as a town planner, a planning board planner, or I'm hired to conduct various planning projects like um, affordable housing plans, redevelopment plans, and what I'll be talking about today, uh, master plans. So to help guide the future of land development in a town like the Greenville, um, South Carolina example, I often refer to a local master plan or comprehensive plan. So in New Jersey, towns are required to update these guiding documents every 10 years to take stock of existing conditions, demographics, reflect current trends, and of course, make recommendations for the future. And in preparing these plans, I'd say the most important aspect is accurately reflecting the wants and needs of the community. And that means gaining insightful and meaningful feedback from residents, business owners, and visitors to help plan for the community's future. So in the upcoming slides, I'll discuss um, you know, my use of unified engagement strategies in order to create successful master plan projects. 
And of course, I do that by using publicinput.com. So the first uh, project I want to talk about is in Smithtown, New York. And if you're unfamiliar with Smithtown, it's located on Long Island, um, just to the east. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, to the east of the city, of New York City. Uh, Smithtown is on the North Shore, uh, smack dab right in the middle of Long Island. Smithtown actually last updated their master plan 50 years ago, so it's been a long time coming, and I think a lot of the residents have some pent-up opinions from the past 50 years about how they'd like to see Smithtown develop in the future. And what's different about New York in particular is that Smithtown, like many of the other towns in New York, have what's called hamlets and villages. And these hamlets and villages almost act as unique neighborhoods uh, within the larger town. You know, so we really needed a unified engagement approach that would address multiple geographies within one area with many different unique identities. You know, I'll also speak a little bit about, um, you know, we did this Smithtown project. We had almost 1,200 survey participants for that project specifically, but St. James is one of the hamlets located in Smithtown, and we were able to partner with uh, Smithtown to do this specialized study uh, only on the St. James downtown, uh, where we were able to get over 500 participants. So just moving on to the next slide, I really want to touch upon this unified outreach approach. So part of executing a successful project is ensuring that all the stakeholders work together. You know, as a consultant, I could easily come in and say what I think should be done in Smithtown and, you know, without listening to any of the local planning staff or the residents, but successful community engagement means creating partnerships, listening to others, being transparent and building trust. In Smithtown, for example, we have the backing of the local government officials and resources extended to us, not only from the planning staff, but also from the local public information officer. We've been able to get the word out about the online survey and in-person community workshops because the town has distributed that information through its social media accounts, on the municipal webpage, followed up those community workshops with video summaries, short videos of about you know, five to seven minutes long each, uh, showing residents this is what the community workshops looked like. This was some of the feedback from the residents. Uh, here are some of your local government, uh, local government leaders speaking about these issues. Please come to the next one. You know, Smithtown was able to get a lot of local newspaper coverage, and Smithtown is also, uh, residents are very, very active in Facebook groups. So I think there's a Facebook group for everything in Smithtown. And luckily, we had a lot of the uh, Facebook group administrators uh, partner with us to make sure that the word got out there about the survey and about the uh, community workshops. So I want to share with you an example of how we put this unified engagement strategy to use. As part of the St. James Hamlet visioning study that we did as a small section of the overall Smithtown master plan, uh, we conducted a visual preference survey as a way to gain feedback from our three-day shred. We built a specific Envisioning St. James website on publicinput.com, and as part of the visual preference survey, we asked participants to select, select images representative of what they'd like to see in the St. James downtown area. Each question was related to a topic such as architectural style, building materials, building scale, uh, building height, and other topics. And in just about a month's time, we had over 500 survey participants. So really the power of that partnership with Smithtown was, was one reason why we were able to get so many participants in such a short amount of time. The three-day charrette was designed as an invite-only event, and it included local organizations. On the first day, with the website up, we turned on what is called meeting mode and asked the invited participants to take the survey on their phones. We were able to show the results in real time, and these results uh, represented only those taking the survey in the room. So it eliminated, you know, with over 500 participants, only those, you know, 40 or so, 40 or so people in the room, that, that was what was being shown up on the screen. 
And, you know, as it turns out, when we went back to our office and we were looking at all the, these results, uh, the results of the survey from meeting mode almost exactly matched the results of the survey from all 533 participants. To be able to compare that data and be able to confirm that the issues and the future wants, uh, the preferences of these residents and business owners and visitors uh, were the same made us realize that this was good data and we could use it as a basis for future recommendations not only in the St. James Envisioning um, study, but also in the Smithtown Comprehensive Plan townwide report that we would be writing. So this is just uh, an example of what meeting mode was. You know, we had it up on the screen here, but we also printed out posters of all the options as part of the shred. You know, not everything can go digital. It's always good to have that, that mixed mode. And so having the posters right there for people to go up to and look at uh, was key to this event. So another unified engagement strategy is our ability to use integrated email management. So just like in Greenville, South Carolina, we had uh, survey participants put in their email at the beginning of the survey and uh, subscribe to updates to the plan. Throughout the plan process, we would update people with upcoming community workshops after the community workshops, we always put together a summary of all the issues given to us by residents, pictures of what was happening at the community workshop, people who spoke, and it just documented and was a great feedback loop, loop for residents to see that we were following up after the community workshop and letting them know, this is what we heard, here are the results, here's the report, please come to the next one. Uh, you know, with the email address as well, a lot of residents don't want to go to the meetings or they've taken the survey and they forgot to say something. So they often email us uh, additional comments. What's great about publicinput.com is that, you know, I can highlight that comment in the email and add it to my comment feed on the back end of publicinput.com. So I'm able to take that comment from the email, add it into the all the comments received as part of this project on the website and use the website's analyzed feature to put everything together in our final report. People like to know what's what's going on. Um, so updating them, you know, not only about the community workshops, but again about an, the upcoming public hearing, seeing a draft of the plan before it's adopted, and being able to provide comments uh, throughout what can be a year-long process is very important. And so this integrated email management has been really fantastic for us because it allows us to close that feedback loop and continue working with everyone. Just like in Smithtown, New York, we've been able to use all the unified engagement strategies in a different town in Westfield, New Jersey. For Westfield, we did a, another comprehensive master plan. We had almost 800 participants here. It's a smaller community, so this was actually a great survey participant turnout. We also had community workshops, just like in Smithtown. We set up the website very similarly. So I, I'll just talk about a little bit about you know, how we set up our community workshops and how we integrate publicinput.com into, into that face-to-face -face engagement. So we typically set up the workshop with a presentation in the beginning, and our presentations are very short, probably 10 to 15 minutes maximum. We get up, uh, we explain what the project is, what we're doing. Uh, we go through the website, explain that this is the landing page, this is where all the information is. Please sign up with your email address. If you have any questions, there's a frequently asked questions section. So we'll go through all of that. And then we ask participants to get up and interact with us on a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-few topic tables. So we'll set up tables around the room and we'll ask uh, residents to come engage with about four or five facilitators from our firm to talk about the issues that are important to them. So we're not up there presenting at them the whole night. We're standing at tables and smaller groups engaging with residents about their issues and about their concerns. We always have a flipboard where we can write down their comments. Um, and at the end of the night, as part of that uh, report that we put together that we emailed to everyone, we take pictures of these flipboards and we type up all the comments and that becomes part of our community engagement. 
We also have a picture here. We have a survey table. So we always invite people to take the survey, you know, at home if they'd like. We have hard copies available. They can, if they want to fill out the hard copy there that night in the room, or they can take it home and drop it off at town hall late, at a later time. We also have laptop setups where uh, residents can take the survey right there in the room online if they prefer. You know, and then surveys are completed. It's easy for us on the back end, uh, this image on the right I'm referring to, it's easy for us on the back end to analyze the results all in one spot. Uh, you know, so here's a, a smart cloud or a tag of cloud of all the comments received. Um, we asked, what do you most like about living and working and visiting in the town of Westfield? And these are the words most often used. So Westfield is actually very, very well known for its schools. It has a great downtown. What we hear at the workshop, that's what we're seeing here on the survey in this image. So as part of the publicinput.com webpage, we always start out with a little introduction paragraph about what the plan is. What's great about publicinput.com is that it's video capable. So in Westfield, we actually have our planner, uh, the town planner on the left, the mayor in the middle, and our planning board chairman on the right have a short roundtable discussion of what a master plan is, why residents' feedback is important, and having that right there on the public input.com page was a great way to validate the project and show that it's official and that it's something that the community is important, uh, passionate about. The mayor is very passionate about it and you have all of these local town officials encouraging you to participate in this project. We also have a frequently asked questions section about what the master plan is in case, you know, they forget after watching the video. And uh, we have a timeline on the side. And just like in Greenville, you can, um, you know, there's community workshop number one, for example, is listed. Uh, you can make that an actual event and have participants RSVP. Some of the other features we have on our landing page is a place to upload related planning documents. So some of the older master plans, Again, a spot for our uh, summary reports of the community workshops, a place to, to subscribe via your email, and of course the survey. So I quickly, before I wrap up, um, because I do want to leave enough time for questions, just a couple of things I want to touch on here is that in Westfield, we were fortunate enough to partner with the community and incentivize people to sign up using their email address. So in Westfield, parking is actually quite a big issue for their downtown area. And so we incentivize people to take the survey and sign up via email uh, with parking smart cards or gift cards, like $50 worth of gift cards. We randomly chose two people at the end of the process and announced in the final presentation who those winners were. So that was another way to get a lot of um, engagement and feedback. And of course, the whole reason we do this is not only to validate the process and get meaningful feedback to help plan for the future of these communities, but it really helps us to write the master plans with these data-driven results. So here, the image on the right-hand side, this is actually a screenshot from our final plan. Um, we were able to show how many people participated, um, where they participated in town, and then of course, the top five issues people voted on uh, in the survey. So uh, one passenger rail service to New York City on the NJ Transit. Um, that's a big topic here in New Jersey recently is New Jersey Transit. Um, you know, that was 68% very important to survey participants. So this data right here on the right hand side, it was a great way to just showcase what the top five issues are in town and how we are going to address those. And again, um, you know, I don't want to leave too little time for questions, but, you know, again, unified engagement strategy can provide data-driven results that as a planner, I can use as a basis for recommendations in the plan. It, helps, it also helps build consensus and validates decisions. And of course, it makes my job a lot easier analyzing the results in one platform at the very end. So I thank you uh, for your time. And if you have any questions, I'll hand it over. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was a really excellent um, set of examples and really cool to see this in action um, all over the country. We do have several questions, Emily and Nicole, for both of you. And then when you were talking about people using iPads to participate, 
Um, and the question is from Larry. It's do you have folks help people sign up on the iPads, such as senior citizens, low literacy, et cetera? Yeah, we do. So we usually have a sign in table um, right as folks are coming into the event. We generally have it, it staffed with two different people. Uh, I would say 98% of people are able to do it on their own, but uh, we, we have, you know, we're standing there to help if, if people need, especially given, you know, we always try to be ADA friendly for folks who, who might need extra assistance. Excellent. Thank you. For both of you, I think this question would apply uh, from Maggie. How do you decide what demographics you want to capture? So I can, I can take that one. This is Nicole again. You know, what's great about publicinput.com is that they have some set demographic questions set up uh, where you can compare the data from the survey to the local census data. Um, and so that really helps us decide what demographic questions we're going to ask. Uh, you know, for example, what is your age? Those are pre-populated to match what the census um, options are so that you can compare on an apples to apples basis. Um, we often ask, what is your age and your race? Uh, we don't often ask gender, but um, you know, I, I believe there's also income level is offered. And we also ask where people work. That's typically uh, the top ones that we, we choose. Yeah, and I just want to piggyback that and say that we, we try to cast a pretty wide net. And of course, it depends on what the actual survey is that you're doing or you know plan, et cetera. But we try to cast that wide net and then using public input tools and the questions that Nicole just mentioned, then you're able to drill down and really compare based on those demographics that are captured. So, so that way we're, we're getting as much data as we can and then we can analyze it how we'd like. Actually a really good um, follow up, uh, Emily, and that was one of the other questions that came through from Denise was about how you summarize your responses by demographic group, um, by age, by income, et cetera. So if there's anything you guys want to add um, about how you can break those down or how you've utilized those. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we try to look at everything, but then if there's, if, if for example, with our rail trail, one of our goals is connecting the neighborhood to the rail trail. So then we're gonna specifically look at where are those folks living so that we can understand their needs and, and how we can best connect them to the trail to make them feel safe, to, you know, whether that is a bridge or um, more effective street crossing or signage or you know, pavement markings, et cetera. We, we don't want to just look at certain demographics, but we want to be able to see and compare the differences and different opinions. Because I think age is, is oftentimes one where you'll see different answers uh, and different needs, different stages in life, et cetera. Nicole, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think Emily um, hit the nail on the head there. I will say that although we haven't been asked by our municipalities to, to segment out specific demographic data for them, uh, we do look at it when we are conducting our comprehensive plans and um, you know another you know this isn't demographic but uh, in smithtown for example we have those six different hamlets that we have to keep in mind as well so we were able to segment segment out the responses by where people live uh, by the six different hamlets to see if you know for instance some were more willing to go to have an appetite for three-story buildings while others had up to five-story buildings, and it really depended on that unique community that they lived in and the historic land development pattern of the place, uh, of that place. And then I am actually kind of summarizing because we got several questions about the same type of thing. So um, I think for this last question, maybe for both of you, can you talk a little bit more about the the feedback that you get um, and how you kind of shape what you're asking for, and then talk a little bit about what kind of analysis the, the software is actually providing to you and how you analyze um, the data, if you have to do anything else with it, or if it kind of comes to you packaged in a way that you can just take and use. So with some of the visuals that I mentioned earlier, I think when we when we ask the questions, and of course, there's certainly an art to asking the questions and sort of getting the type of feedback that you want, because you, you really don't want to be just a bash fest where people go on and 
complain, oh, blah, blah, blah. Um, you're, you're trying to be constructive in the way that you're shaping these questions. So depending on how you structure the questions in your survey, it kind of spits out and public input these really nice visuals. And then I usually go on and wind up screenshotting those and use those in our internal presentations to kind of display the effectiveness and, and how people feel. And, and I know I mentioned that earlier, but just people <laughs> work really well with visuals. So that, that's been really good. Um, Nicole? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, when we are designing the surveys, we always try to make the surveys short. Um, and, you know, there's a million questions you could ask, uh, but we do try to keep the survey somewhat uh, shorter so that people aren't dropping out by question 30. And we always uh, vet the questions by the local municipality. And uh, depending on the town, um, they'll add more, change the format. But, you know, like Emily said, these you know, you set up the question to get the most valuable information from it, especially that data-driven result uh, for me, um, that percentage of, you know, what is an issue, is this a hot topic? Uh, and the results at the end, what, what's great about publicinfo.com is that you have what's called the dynamic reporting. So you can actually share an active link with the local municipality so they can just put that in their browser and see real life, real time, in an easy to understand format with charts already all set up for you uh, of the survey results. So we often use just an export of that at the end as you know, like an appendix to the plan to say, here, here are the survey results. I don't have to do any charts or anything. Um, if you wanna change something from a pie chart to a graph, uh, you can easily do that in the dynamic reporting mode that publicinput.com has set up for you. And you know our master plans are very graphic oriented. We have, like to have a lot of pictures and a lot of you know as little text as possible, but that's still informative. Uh, and so what's great about publicinput.com is that those graphics are already set up for us, and we're easily able to take a screenshot like Emily and and put that into our plan. Excellent. Thank you guys so much. Um, I think that wraps all the questions that we got through the chat. Um, a huge, huge thanks to Graham, Emily, and Nicole for presenting. Um, you guys were amazing, and it was really, really cool to see uh, unified engagement and action around the country. That was really neat. Um, you can contact us using the information on this slide, um, and we really appreciate you guys participating today and joining us, um, sharing your time with ELGL um, and with our wonderful partners here at Public Input, and we will end today's webinar with that. Thank you all so much, and happy holidays.